Hey guys, just making sure my audio is working. Can you hear me? All right. You guys can go ahead and get started on the warm up if you want to. You guys are just coming in. Go ahead and get started on the warm up. You have five minutes. You guys have about two minutes left on the warm up. So on this day, the Columbine school shooting happened. 13 students were killed. So why this is such an important event really in US history is this is kind of the uh, dividing date for when school shootings became a big problem in this country. Uh, the Columbine school shooting wasn't the first school shooting to take place. It actually wasn't even technically the largest at this time. There was a school shooting that took place at the University of Texas in the 1970s uh, where more students were killed. But uh, this was the largest high school school shooting at the time. It was uh, the largest K through 12 shooting at the time. It is not anymore. Uh, there have been three uh, school shootings that have been bigger than this one. 
And it started this idea of kind of random mass violence at that targeted school. So to kind of put it into perspective for you, there have been 46 active shooters uh, since 1999 uh, in schools. Uh, the previous 20 years, we don't have a lot of data, but the best we can see is that there were about two. Um, so since this has happened 46 before this, there had been about two. Um, and why that is, is really a pretty big mystery. Um, a lot of people think uh, at the time they had this big idea that it was because of violence in video games or violence in movies, things like that. Um, some people blame Marilyn Manson uh, and violent music. Uh, other people have actually said that it's the shooting itself. It was how the media covered it, that the media got so obsessed with this. And this was huge. Uh, this was a massive media event that it kind of created this copycat uh, killer uh, concept. But if you don't know the shooting story of Columbine, it was two students that did it. Uh, that was a very unique thing still to this day. It's very unique to have two people trying to coordinate a mass shooting. Um, and their intention was to blow up the school. They had actually put bombs in the cafeteria and they wanted to blow up the school. However, their bombs did not go off. Um, and so because of that, they had a backup plan, which is where they went out to their cars and they had guns in their cars and they grabbed guns and they killed 13 students before killing themselves. Uh, the students seem to be targeted as well, which is also a difference between the school shooting and others. Most of the time, the school shootings are indiscriminate, meaning they're just killing random people. Uh, this, they seem to target uh, athletes, Christians, and minorities. Uh, Columbine is in Denver, Colorado, so about 92% of the school is white. Um, but uh, if you were non-white, you seem to be targeted. If you were an outspoken Christian, you seem to be targeted. And if you were a jock, you seem to be targeted. All right. So that is your today in history. All right. Um, let's go to now the update on the AP review. This is pretty big stuff. So what I'm changing going forward is that flashcards are going to be optional for period six or period three through six. You are still going to be required to do the flashcards for the first three periods. So period one and two and seven, you still need to do those flashcards. But going forward, the flashcards are going to be optional. Um, you are still going to be required to do the question outline. So I'll show you what that means. And it's going to be encouraged that if you don't know what the flashcard terms are, that you make flashcards for those terms. Um, I would also highly recommend that you have a system uh, available to you to where you would have all these terms. So maybe what you could do is make one massive Word document and have it on your computer so that you could search for terms that you need while taking this exam. It seems like there is not going to be a secure locked browser for this. What that means is that when you start the test, you'll be able to click like out of it and go to a Word document if you need to. I'm getting more confirmation about that, but I will be able to let you know uh, more. Okay, so uh, any questions about this here? Let me show you what I mean. Yeah, Jeremiah, I'm going to talk about uh, what the superintendent talked about. Um, so how the flashcards work, you were originally told that you needed to do a flashcard for every single term. All right, so that meant that you would do a flashcard for this one, this one, this one, onward and down. Now you don't need to. Instead, what you need to do is you still need to do a flashcard for this question. So you'll write this question on the front. And then you'll write these terms on the back to just give you a visual of what that looks like. This would be the front of your flashcard. You would write this question down. How did the competition between the French, British, and natives lead to the American Revolution? And then on the back side, you would um, do all of these terms that are associated with it. One thing that I would recommend if you are anxious about this, because to be honest, I, I'm not super thrilled that I'm not deassigning flashcards. I think it's very helpful for you. I think it'd benefit a lot of you, but I recognize the time constraints 
some of you guys uh, have a lot of stuff that you need to do. Um, and so I'm trying to be sensitive to that. So something that you could do if you wanted to is you could do, again, this question on the front, write these terms on the back. And then if you wanted to write short definitions for all the terms on the back that kind of relate to the question, you could do that like I've done here. Okay. So you will still need to do these. So for example, uh, for this period, you have seven questions. So you'll have seven questions like this. So you should have seven flashcards. And again, if you want to make the flashcard still, you are allowed to do that, but you uh, are not required. Okay, any questions? Can you flip the card over again? Yeah. Like that? Or do you want it with the definitions? Oh, that's fine. Okay, we're good. Okay. All right. Um, Barack Obama, um, the flashcards are part of the AP review. So it's just the AP review. And if you have more questions, just stay after with me. So yeah, uh, Myra, you want to make a flashcards like this. So you want to make the question flashcards. So you would have seven for this period. And again, how you get those questions is it's the bolded red part of the flashcard worksheet, which is on my website. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, um, so just really quickly, we're also gonna talk about grades in this class. Uh, Dr. Christarfin, the superintendent came out on Friday and basically announced that your grade cannot be lower than it was on March 13th. Um, so you can improve your grade, but you cannot lower your grade. Um, now for most of you guys, the work that I'm assigning is benefiting your grade. Um, for me, it's not gonna be piecemealed. So if you want the March 13th grade, you can, you can take that. Um, but if you don't, then you need to be doing the work. Um, that I'm assigning and turning it in. Uh, for a lot of us, it's not gonna be nearly as important for two reasons. One, the work that you're doing is improving your grade. Like it, it almost assuredly will improve your grade. And then two, you still have an AP test uh, that you should be preparing for. Um, now, if you don't wanna take the AP test and if you don't wanna, then we can talk about that. Correct. If you do the work in this class, your grade will improve. How you check, great question, Barack Obama. Uh, how you check your grade from March 13th is it's your midterm grade. So there should be some way to check what your midterm grade is. Correct to hear. So your grades can't go lower than what they were on March 13th, mid semester. So Jeremiah, they're still like talking about that. There's a possibility that if you don't do anything from March 13th, you'll still pass the semester, but you'll have to do something in the fall because it's gonna prove that you didn't do any work like for the second half of the semester. So I'm not 100% sure. Mayal, just to make sure I understand. So you're saying if my grade was higher on March 13th than what it is, what it is now would my final grade, what would my final grade be if I stopped doing work? Um, again, if you stop doing work, so, okay, I'm gonna give you just the full rundown. Uh, if you don't turn something in, what I have to do is then I have to call your house twice a week uh, until you turn something in. If you can't provide that there's any type of technical difficulty and you're just like refusing to do the work, then there's probably gonna be a program, like an extended program that you have to go through in the fall, but it won't affect your grade. So it's not like you can't do, they're trying to make it to where you're doing your work, but it's not really affecting GPA for everybody, um, if that makes sense. It could only improve your grade. 
Correct, Adam. And this is one of those things I didn't really like, so we are supposed to talk about this with you. I would highly encourage you if you have more questions to reach out to your counselors and things like that, because they're changing this every single week. Most of you guys in this class, I have, I have shaped this class for it to be something that's going to benefit your grade if you're doing the work and something that's relatively straightforward in how we do this. I'm sorry to hear that, Marquez. Okay, but that is how it will work. You're gonna get your test grades on Wednesday. We'll work on that, Maya. Okay, so that is grades and today in history. Paper grades you will get Friday and I'm gonna email you your paper grades. I'm not sure, Lyle. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at what your schedule for this week is. This is the calendar for the class. So we have class today. Uh, since you only have flashcards now that are very quick to get through, um, you will have a, oh, we're up here. You should do your flashcards today. There's a new DBQ walkthrough video that you need to watch for this week, and there's a worksheet for that that you'll fill out. We'll have class on Wednesday. You can do your study guides then. And then your assessments this week, you have three different assessments. Your first one is your crash course for 37 and 38. This is your last crash course quiz of the entire year. Congratulations. You'll have quiz 16. That's over five different sets of notes. It's the Truman and Eisenhower notes, which were, there were two, social issues in Cold War. And then there's three Kennedy and Johnson. Uh, there's Kennedy and Johnson Cold War. There's Kennedy rise of liberalism and then Johnson fall of liberalism, which we'll talk about today. And then you have your period three review. Crash course 37 and 38 and quiz 16 are due at 4 p.m. on Friday. Do it 4 p.m. on Friday. Please make sure you do it. It's how I do your attendance for the week, which is one of those ways to decide which students are going to be in this fall programs and which ones not, are not is based off of your virtual attendance, which is by how you take these assessments. Okay. Any questions about what your week should look like? Well, let's go ahead and get started. Go ahead and get out wherever you're gonna write this stuff down and title it Johnson and the Fall of Liberalism. I am Olivia. Those are gonna to start to be posted on Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I've been trying to get them done at just a lot of stuff. Okay, so the title of your notes is Johnson and the Fall of Liberalism. They should already be posted, Natasha. Thank you about the compliment on my mustache, Adam. So title of your notes is Johnson, the fall of liberalism. So liberalism became a really big idea while Kennedy was president. Kennedy dies and then the very next president, all of a sudden liberalism is not gonna last very long. And that's because it's going to change on itself. Now this guy is not President Lyndon B. Johnson. This is another politician named Barry Goldwater. And he is going to be very, very important because he sets up the current dynamics of how our political system looks today. So let's get into it. Let's start first with Johnson's liberalism. Johnson's liberalism is called the Great Society. 
It was the name of Johnson's social program, and he wanted to declare war on poverty. He thought that it was possible for the United States to not have a single poor person in the country. So he wanted to rapidly expand the services for people who were low income. Some people called the Great Society the second New Deal, or the, the second coming of the New Deal. There is already a second New Deal. So he created a bunch of programs, a lot of which are still around today. One of those which is still around is called the Head Start Program, which is where they give more money to schools um, for students that have low income students in them. So for example, you might know that our lunches are totally free in our school. That is actually through a program that the school applied for in the Head Start program. There's Medicare and Medicaid. You probably have heard of those programs, which is where you get low cost or free healthcare. If you're older, if you're older than the age of 65, or if you're low income. So it's possible that you, um, it depends on your situation. You could be on Medicare or Medicaid. If you're low income, you're on Medicaid. If you live with a grandparent or something like that, you might be on Medicare. And then the final thing is that there would be more federal dollars that would go towards education in low income and urban areas. These schools that receive this are called Title I schools. We are a Title I school. So what that means is not only do we get money from the state to fund our school, but we get money from the federal government to fund our school as well. Olivia, what's the last thing you can't see, or you can see? Um, I can just see the last sentence, like care for poor families, and then it cuts off. Okay. Let me see if I can try to fix that real quick. Oh, never mind. It was just the um, like the screen with your face on it was covering it up. I moved it. Oh, gotcha. Oh, is my face still showing? We don't need that. Let's figure out how to turn that off. Title of the notes is Johnson and the Fall of Liberalism. So I wouldn't say uh, to people asking, why are we so broke? We're in like a $10 million building. To be fair, we're actually probably in like a 40 to $60 million building. Um, but it's not being broke in terms of the school itself is not broke. It's more about trying to make sure students who have uh, – like come from lower income families that we can provide services for them. That is, if you're a student that's not a low income family, you might not necessarily need. Sage, I'll try to let the federal government know that our bathrooms need a little bit of help. Most of that money actually goes to like school supplies, I think, but maybe we could try to get bathroom repair on the list. All right, anyone still need this slide?
Okay, let's keep going then. So what happened to liberalism? The biggest thing that happened to liberalism was the liberal party itself. So the Democrat party basically split. And this is a problem that the Democrat party still has today. You can actually still see it very, very clearly today. You're gonna to be able to see it very clearly in the 2020 election. Because there became this idea called the new left. And the new left felt like there wasn't enough being done for liberalism, meaning that there were not enough rights being given to people. There were not enough services being provided. They wanted more radical change. Now, the people who are going to be more part of the new left are going to be mainly younger. So younger Democrats are going to be part of the new left. Older Democrats are going to be just the part of the old left, the, the liberal part, the, the, the original part. So student organizations began to form. One of them was called Students for Democrat Society, the SDS. And these students wanted radical change, and they also wanted to change their stance on Vietnam. They hated the Vietnam War. So they wanted the Democrat Party to stop support of the Vietnam War and to get more done for the civil rights movement. Now, because of this, this was a pretty pro-civil rights group of people. MLK and other civil rights leaders sided with this part of the Liberal Party. Now today in the Democrat Party, if you're not really familiar with modern politics, today the Democrat Party again still kind of has this divide. If you're part of the new left, you're probably more of like a Bernie Sanders supporter. If you are um, part of like what the original idea of liberalism was, or if you're kind of part of that old guard of liberalism, then you're probably more of like a Joe Biden supporter. Bernie Sanders supporters basically feel like that Joe Biden and his supporters don't want to actually get the radical change done that they feel like needs to be done in the country. Joe Biden and his supporters would say that people that are part of the Bernie Sanders supporters basically aren't gonna get anything done because their ideas are so radical, they're not gonna be able to get support from enough people. Anyone still need this slide? Lauren, just let me know when you're done. Okay. 
So what are the effects of the new left? Well, this really defines like uh, 1960s culture for how it's kind of remembered. Because the new left is almost gonna form its own type of culture and it's kind of called, it's called a counterculture, which is where people would reject mainstream US history culture. This is where the hippies would come from. And one thing that I love talking about in May, but we don't have time to talk about now just because of the structure of the class and how that's changed. But uh, one thing uh, that this counterculture did, this started like the sex revolution, some of the drug revolution, people began to uh, reject traditional values in the United States. Now the mainstream parts of the counterculture movement, which I know sound a little bit strange because counterculture is rejecting the mainstream, but I just said mainstream of counterculture. But, so the main veins though, the biggest groups at the heart of the counterculture movement, the first is gonna be called second wave feminism. Now, if you're wondering when was first wave feminism, that was in the 1920s when women got the right to vote. So Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Stanton, you could even include like flappers. That's first wave feminism. Second wave feminism is started by a lady named Betty Friedman. She wrote a book called The Feminine Mystique. And in The Feminine Mystique, she wanted women to challenge gender norms and push for women equality. Now, it makes total sense, honestly, why this happened in the early 60s as well. 1940s, women were working in factories. A ton of them were working in factories. 1950s, some women are having to move back into the household and are not satisfied with that lifestyle anymore. So they've been cooped up in the house for 10 years. They experienced the excitement of working in a factory in the 1940s. And so because of that, they want to challenge it. Another idea would have been that you were a young person in the 1940s when your mom was working at a factory. And she has now raised you to basically believe that women should be working in society. They are the exact same as men. And so now those women have risen up to be 20, 22 years old. And they're part of the second wave feminism. Second wave feminism for an organization called the National Organization of Women, now. And they argue for something called the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, the Equal Rights Amendment is very, very simple. Let me explain what it does. The Equal Rights Amendment states that women are equal to men in the world, in society. That you cannot discriminate based off of a woman versus a man. That should be pretty simple to pass, but it's not going to actually get passed. It's going to pass through Congress, but for an amendment to pass, it can't just pass through Congress. Something like 70% of states have to agree to it as well, and 70% of the states did not agree to it. The reason for why was actually attacks from other women. Women basically felt like now that they would be forced to do the same thing as men. Big things that were talked about during this time. This is during the Vietnam War, the military drafts going on during the Vietnam War. The military draft did not draft women. So people who were against the Equal Rights Amendment basically were saying that now, if this passed, maybe women could get drafted. Another big thing that was talked about, we've already actually talked about today, bathrooms. People felt like that the bathrooms would become single sex bath or would, that were single sex bathrooms would now just be anyone can have it. Like any like what's it called? Missing the word. Unisex. Unisex. Thank you. Unisex bathrooms. And that really freaked people out. Now there's been calls recently for unisex bathrooms again. 
basically you could just go in any bathroom. And it's pretty amazing because states started passing actual bathroom bills stating that you were assigned, you were legally required to go to a certain bathroom. Uh, most of the reason for why that was being talked about, which is like just, it, it defies logic. So I just need to explain it really quickly because it kind of bothers me. Is because they were saying that men could potentially go into bathrooms that women were in and molest women. So people who were against this were basically saying that, you know, women aren't being protected with men going to the bathroom. I'm just gonna let you guys know that a molester, like, is already somebody who's kind of breaking laws. And because of that, they're probably not gonna listen to the bathroom law. So it's not a very good argument. All right, uh, the other thing is gonna pass during this time from second wave feminism is Roe versus Wade. So abortion is going to be passed and abortion rights are seen as a pro-women's right. Anyone still need this? All right. Khalil, I'll go back to it at the end, just kind of leave a little space. So another environmentalist movement that's going to start is called, uh, or another movement that's gonna start from the new left is the environmentalist movement. It also started with a book. People used to read a lot more back then. And that book was called Silent Spring. It's written by this lady named Rachel Carson. And she just wrote about how the uh, world is very interconnected and our environment is very fragile. She was an early cider, basically, if something small changes in the climate, it could have actually a very disastrous impact on the United States. And while certain things started, like Earth Day, that was like seen as a big accomplishment, which I think Earth Day is this week. Um, no one's really going to change their behavior. And we pretty much let climate change continue for the next 50 years. But there were some small changes that were made. We used to actually burn a lot more stuff than we burn now. So people have figured some of that stuff out. And there were certain hazardous materials that were released into the air that were creating a hole in the ozone. Ozone is a part of our uh, atmosphere. And that has actually been fixed for a large part. The ozone hole that was there is, uh, is closing up. So we're, we're fixing that part. The US did create something called the Environment Protection Agency which was designed to make sure that people followed environmental laws. And we still have that today, although it has been largely defunded uh, by President Trump. All right, anyone need this still? I'm done. Yeah. All right. 
Now, I want you to look really quickly at these three election maps. Uh, these maps actually really show uh, the last three elections. So we have Obama McCain, this is 2008 up here. We have 2012 to the bottom left, that's Obama, Mitt Romney. And then 2016 was Trump and Hillary Clinton. Now, one thing we'll start with 2016 that you can look at is you can see the part of the country that President Trump won that is not normally won by a Republican president. And that's right in here in these Great Lakes states, right? If you look 2012, 08, uh, Democrats won both of those. Um, so that's just something to point out. One thing though I do wanna point out that's very consistent through all of this is the Northeast and the West Coast is usually always Democrat. And then the Southeast where we are is always Republican. Now, if you look at 1960, you'll see a big difference. 1960, you have the entire South is almost all blue, right? Then if you go to 1968, you're gonna notice that the South is all red or gold. We, we'll talk about that gold a little bit later. But what you'll notice is that from 1960 to 1968, this is when the Democrat party lost the South. What Democrats are worried about with President Trump is they're worried that if they don't get this back this election, that they may never get it back, just as if they lost the South in this election. Now, why did they lose the South from 1960 to 1968? It's because of the second reason for why liberalism fell. So the first reason why liberalism fell was because of the new left. Second reason why it fell was because of the rise of something called conservatism. This was an idea created by Barry Goldwater. Now, Barry Goldwater ran for president in 1964, and he created this idea called conservatism, which was very limited government reaction, interaction. The government should not do anything unless it absolutely has to. If you've seen those people who are protesting the end of this quarantine, I don't know if you saw that, that's kind of popped up in the news in the past couple of days. These people would kind of believe in this idea of called conservatism. Basically, the government shouldn't do anything. If I want to go out and get coronavirus, let me go out and get coronavirus. You can't tell me I can't do that. That is literally the argument being made by these people. Now, he got crushed, but the South did vote for him. Anyone want to take a guess, why did the South vote for Barry Goldwater in 1964? What was the U.S. starting, what was the U.S. government starting to really enforce that maybe the South wouldn't like? Somebody can just shout it out if they want to. about it 1964 federal government starting to get involved in an issue that maybe the south wouldn't want them to get involved in civil rights is right so the south votes for barry goldwater because this is kind of seen as a way for the federal government to not enforce civil rights if i want to be racist let me be racist the government has no right to tell me not to be racist Now, he lost, but the major reason why he lost actually had nothing to do with this. The major reason why he lost, and there's no other way to say this, Barry Goldwater was crazy. And Barry Goldwater had a fascination with nuclear weapons, somewhat similar, I will say, to maybe my own fascination with nuclear weapons. But while I just enjoy talking about how powerful nuclear weapons were, Barry Goldwater very much wanted to just use nuclear, nuclear weapons as if it was like the new gun. He's like, if the Vietnam people like don't want to become American or don't want to like become democratic, let's just nuke them. And you know what? While we're at it, let's nuke China. And why aren't we nuking Russia already? 
we got all these nuclear weapons. We should use them. Just so you guys know, if you ever run for president, it is not a very smart idea to just say that you're really, you're really willing to nuke anyone that you want to. He had a common phrase, and that phrase was, we must learn to love each other or we must die. And there's a big gap between death and love, just to let you guys know. You can tolerate a lot before having to die. So people don't elect Barry Goldwater because they, they don't you know, want to go to nuclear war. But this is a strategy that's going to be duplicated in 1968 by Richard Nixon. Now, Nixon is a very controversial president. He's our only president to ever resign. He probably would have been kicked out of office. But he changed the term a little bit to this idea called the silent majority, which is that there's this big group of people and they don't really post on message boards. They don't post their political views on social media or during this time, they just don't talk about what's going on, but all they want to do is return to normal. Now, what does normal mean? That is a great vague question that Nixon never really answered. And because of that, people began to fill in the blank of what normal meant. For some people, normal meant the end of the Vietnam War. So if you didn't like the Vietnam War, you voted for Richard Nixon. There were other people that thought it was the end of the civil rights movement. So if you didn't like the civil rights movement, you voted for Richard Nixon. That's a big diversity in class. And one of the reasons why Nixon absolutely dominated in 1968 and why he dominated in 1972, he won two elections by huge margins. He didn't really need to cheat in the election to win, but Nixon was also kind of crazy. We got a lot of crazy politicians at this point. Right, I'm going to try a trick. If this takes the PowerPoint off the screen, somebody just let me know and I'll go back. But I think I've paused it. Can you guys still see the PowerPoint? Yep. Now, when Johnson ran against Barry Goldwater, he created the first real modern political ad. And this political ad is called the Daisy Girl ad. It only ran one time on TV. And it was so controversial that it never had to run again. And so what you'll see, I'm gonna show you the ad really quickly on my screen. And what you'll see is he's gonna be, uh, the voice that you're going to hear is actually a speech from Barry Goldwater. Um, and he basically is setting up the terms that if you don't vote for me, you're going to vote for this madman, Barry Goldwater, and we're all going to die. All right, so let's watch the ad real quick. You should be able to hear it, but if you can't, let me know. Mr. Murray, we can't see it. 
I got it. Okay. To make a world in which all of God's children can live. Our Yeah, we tried. Can't figure that out. <laughs> you can share your screen and then just go to the YouTube tab. Yeah, that's what I was doing. So, <laughs> why it's not working? Oh, I do know why it's not working. It's okay. It's not worth it. Um, all right. So, last two slides are going to be on why 1968 sucked. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So 1968 really sucked for three reasons. We didn't get this down last time, correct? We did not talk about the Tet Offensive or did we talk about the Tet Offensive? So the first reason why 1968 was really, really bad was because it was when we figured out that we were losing the Vietnam War. Up until 1968, which we had been fighting in the Vietnam War for three years, up until 1968, it seemed like we were really, really winning. We did talk about it last time. Well, if you already have this written down, you don't need to write it down again. If you don't have it written down, go ahead and write it down. I'll move through it quickly because it kind of all connects anyway. I thought we did talk about it too. So we thought we were winning the Vietnam War up until 1968. And then in January of 1968, Vietnam, Viet Cong, and North Vietnam launched this massive attack called the Tet Offensive. If you see this map on the right, it just meant that the Vietnamese people, the Northern Vietnamese army attacked all those spots at the same exact time on the same exact day. What they were trying to show was that they could hit any part of Vietnam at any point that they wanted to. It made the US realize that they weren't anywhere close to winning the Vietnam War. And in fact, maybe North Vietnam was winning. And this was a massive psychological victory and the Vietnam War becomes very, very unpopular. Well, the Vietnam War becoming very unpopular made Andrew Johnson, sorry, not Andrew Johnson, Lyndon B. Johnson, very mad. He thought the Vietnam War was going to be his big crowning achievement. And he just continued to get criticized by this new left group. Because the new left, remember, they wanted more civil rights and they didn't want the Vietnam War. So his own party, he feels like, is attacking him. Not only that, Johnson felt like he wasn't getting credit for passing major civil rights acts. Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, he had gotten those acts through, but people said that that wasn't enough. And so he felt unappreciated. And Johnson, he's a pretty brash person. If you ever watch a movie and they portray uh, Lyndon B. Johnson in it, he's going to swear a lot. Apparently he swore all the time. And he was a pretty tough guy. He did things his own way. So. 1968 is the election year. He's supposed to run for re-election. Everyone thinks he's going to run for re-election, but he doesn't like all the criticism he's getting. So he just gives double middle fingers to his own political party, says he's not going to run for re-election in March. This would be like if President Trump basically today told the Republican Party he wasn't going to run. Yeah, Dylan, I'm not, I think we will. So now the Democrat Party is scrambling to find a new candidate, but they have good news. They have a golden boy sitting in the wing, a second coming of John F. Kennedy, literally. And that's Robert Kennedy. 
anyone need this slide still? This will be our last slide. So the second reason why 1968 sucked was because of this presidential election. So I just told you because of Vietnam, Johnson decides to not run for re-election, but that's okay. Robert Kennedy's gonna run. He looks like his brother. He talks like his brother. He's not quite as good looking as his brother, but people don't really talk about that that much, but he's not unattractive. Super popular is running away with the nomination, and then he's assassinated. So John F. Kennedy was assassinated and his brother Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Not only that, he's assassinated in July. In August, the Democrats have to officially submit who their, their nominee is going to be for president. Johnson's not running. Kennedy's dead. And the Democrats don't have a president. So they have what's called the Democrat National Convention. They call all the important Democrats to one place, and they're going to vote on a nominee. And it's going to go horrible because you have this divided political party you have the new left and then you have the original left and these guys are now they hate each other as much as they hate the other political parties so they literally start fist fighting at this convention like actual politicians start fighting each other chaos breaks out and people begin to go to where the Democrat National Convention is and start to protest outside, mainly students from the Democrat Society. This new left group start to go there to protest to try to get the nominee voted for who's going to get them out of the Vietnam War. Well, this is taking place in Chicago, and the mayor of Chicago, he's not having any of that. He hates hippies. And so he tells 10,000 police officers to go down to this convention and get people to get out of there or beat the living crap out of them until they do. So these 10,000 police officers go down to where all these protesters are and they pull out their billy clubs and they just start whack a mole in a hippie. I mean, they're beating them left and right. And there's TV cameras right there. And they're showing this police brutality taking place. This was a today in history. Yeah. You guys are now seeing why I do today in histories like this, it's so that you kind of get a background knowledge on stuff that we talk about in notes. In the end, the Democrats choose a nominee. It's not really important who the nominee is because he gets destroyed by Nixon because the party is completely split. So Richard Nixon wins the presidential election of 1968 because he basically doesn't have an opponent. And the third reason why 1968 sucked, we've already talked about it actually, it was a TNA in history last week, which is MLK was assassinated. This also causes national riots to take place. Riots all over the country. So three really bad things happened in 1968. We realize we're losing the Vietnam War. Johnson decides to not run for president. The guy who's gonna replace him is killed. So the Democrats don't have a nominee. Richard Nixon's gonna win. And then MLK is also assassinated. It's a pretty, pretty bad year. It's probably not 2020 bad, but, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll make a big turnaround. Maybe, like, the, the back half of 2020 is going to be awesome. We have – I have to admit, we've probably had the best spring weather I've ever seen.
Um, Makiba, I think you're asking, are they mostly white? The protesters, yeah, they were mostly white. The thunder was very loud yesterday. I do agree with that. That was that was kind of strange. All right, guys, so this is notes. This is the last set of notes for quiz 16. Uh, I will post quiz 16 on my AP tomorrow, and then you have until four o'clock to take it. The second thing that I'll let you know is tomorrow on my website, I will also post this on the Instagram page. I will be posting a quiz 16 review so it can help you study for quiz 16. You cannot retake quiz 16. You only have one shot at it. So make sure that you're ready. No, you have to take quiz 16 by 4 p.m. on Friday. Sorry, I'm posting it tomorrow, but you have until 4 p.m. on Friday. Be working on that AP review. If you have any questions, feel free to stay back. I'm going to stop the recording now, um, and you guys are free to go. But if you have questions, you can ask me.